Welcome. Let's take a look at maximizing the water carrying capacity of a rain gutter. A rain gutter is to be constructed from, a sh from sheet metal 30 centimeters wide by bending it 10 centimeters in from both ends. Find the angle of those bends that will result in the maximum carrying capacity of the gutter. Okay, so let's start by uh, drawing a picture and understanding what's going on in this context. So we have a 30 centimeter uh, piece of metal. So I'm going to draw that like this. So this is 30 centimeters in length. Now we're going to go in 10 centimeters from each end so approximately here and approximately here. So each of these segments is 10 centimeters. And we're going to build, bend upward the left and the right 10 centimeters through some angle. So we're going to end up with something that looks maybe like this, where we bend up the left and the right sides and our uh, ring gutter looks something like this. And so we are asked in this case to find the angle of those bends. So we want to find this angle theta that we have to bend those that will maximize the water carrying capacity. Well, the water carrying capacity of this rain gutter is affected by the cross-sectional area of the rain gutter. So in essence, what we want to do is maximize the area of this cross-section, and that will allow the maximum amount of water to pass through. So we have a trapezoid here, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, focus on how we might think about the area of a trapezoid. Uh, before we do that, notice that this angle theta is on the outside of the trapezoid. It would be more convenient to have it on the inside. Now notice that if we bend both of these left hand and right hand 10 centimeter segments, through the exact same angle, the height of the left endpoint and the right endpoint will be equal. And basically, we'll have this horizontal line that is parallel to the base. And if this horizontal line is parallel to the base, then we have two parallel lines, and we know that alternate interior angles are congruent. That means this angle theta and this angle up here in the upper left will be congruent. So we know that this angle is also angle theta, and the same is true over here on the right-hand side. So both of those angles have a measure of theta. So there's our uh, rain gutter. Now, as we look at this rain gutter, uh, there's a couple of ways we can think about finding the area. And probably the easiest and most straightforward would be to think about this in terms of having one rectangle in the center and then two triangles on the left and on the right so that our area is the area of the rectangle plus two times the area of the triangles. And if we do that, then the area of the rectangle is, uh, well, we don't have a, a second dimension here. We don't know how high that is. So let's go ahead and label that H. So then our area of our rectangle would be 10 times h plus, 
And then now we need to work with the area of the triangles. So let's take one of these triangles and just focus on it. So we have a triangle here. This is going to be a right angle in the upper right. We know that this is the angle theta. We know that the hypotenuse from the bending of the metal is 10 centimeters. And we've called this side H. Let's go ahead and give a, a label for the remaining side that we don't know. Let's go ahead and call that W. So then if we do that, um, we can say that the area of the triangle is one half uh, base times height. The base, <laughs> uh, depending on how you want to eat, uh, re rearrange or rotate your uh, triangle could be H or W, but in either case we get one half H times W. If it helps, we can just rotate that triangle a little bit and see that we can use H as our base and W as our height. So now we have the area of our uh, rain gutter, our cross-sectional area being 10H plus H times W. Now at this point, we have um, two variables. We've got H and W, and we need to be able to rewrite this in terms of a single variable. And when I look at my triangle here, I can see that I have three unknowns. I've got an H, a W, and a theta. So let's look at some trigonometric functions to see if maybe we can rewrite H and W in terms of another variable, in this case theta. And that would be extremely helpful because we're asked about the angle of those bends. And in our function right now, we have nothing referencing an angle. So um, let's go ahead and look at what is the sine of angle theta. So the sine of angle theta would be the side opposite over hypotenuse. So that would be h over 10, which means that we could replace h with 10 times sine theta. And if we look at the cosine of theta in our triangle, cosine of angle theta would be the side adjacent over hypotenuse, so that would be w over 10. So this equals w over 10, which would allow us to replace w with 10 cosine theta. Now if I can replace both H and W, my area function will now be a function of theta. So we end up with area is equal to 10 times 10 sine theta plus 10 sine theta times 10 cosine theta. So our area is 100 sine theta plus 100 sine theta cosine theta. So hopefully this now makes some sense. Um, so now let's think about um, the domain of our angle theta. So as we think about theta and folding these two segments upward, uh, theta could be as small as 0, and theta could be as large as pi. Of course, if I, if I fold these sides all the way through an angle pi, the um, rain gutter won't be carrying any water, but that is a feasible domain. So now let's start thinking about our critical points. We have our derivative and now we're ready to find our critical points. So let's find our derivative first. So a prime 
the derivative of 100 sine theta is 100 cosine theta plus, and then we'll have to use the product rule on the second term. Using the product rule, the derivative of sine is cosine theta times cosine theta uh, plus sine theta times negative sine theta. Again, using the product rule on that second term. So a prime equals 100 cosine theta plus 100 cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Now at this point we have uh, cosine one variable theta, but we've got two different trigonometric functions. We've got the cosine function and we've got the sine function. So this will be easier if, if it's possible to uh, either have our function entirely in terms of cosine or in terms of sine because we know that we're going to have to consider where this function equals zero. So what we're going to do is we're going to use um, a Pythagorean identity. We're going to use the, the identity uh, cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1. Well, if I subtract cosine squared theta from both sides of this equation, we know that sine squared theta equals 1 minus cosine squared theta. So a prime we can rewrite as 100 cosine theta plus 100 times cosine squared theta minus and we're replacing sine squared theta with 1 minus cosine squared theta. Now let's go ahead and collect up like terms, simplify, and so forth. So a prime equals 100 cosine theta plus, I'm going to distribute my 100, so 100 cosine squared theta minus 100 plus 100 cosine squared theta. Simplifying further, um, I'm going to put my squared terms first. So I've got two of the cosine squared thetas. I've actually got two 100s. So I've got 200 cosine squared theta plus 100 cosine theta minus 100. So that's our derivative. And at this point, we can consider finding critical points. The two sources of critical points are where the derivative is equal to zero or where the derivative does not exist. Well, I've got a nice trigonometric function here of cosine. There are no domain issues. Um, it is nice and smooth and continuous and differentiable. So there really is no domain issues. There's nowhere where the derivative does not exist. So we can say that there are none, no locations where that happens. So now we focus on where does this derivative equal zero? So now we're looking at the equation 200 cosine squared theta plus 100 cosine theta minus 100 equals zero. And the first place I would start here is um, factoring out a common uh, factor, in this case 100. So we have 100 times 2 cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus 1 equals zero. If we divide both sides of this equation by 100, we now have 2 cosine squared theta plus cosine theta minus 1 equals 0. We can factor this um, into 2 cosine theta and cosine theta here. Um, we want the 
the last term to be a 1. Outside minus, uh, plus inside should be a positive 1 cosine theta. So this factor is to be 2 cosine theta minus 1 times cosine theta plus 1. Now taking each of these factors and setting them equal to 0, 2 cosine theta minus 1 equals 0, means 2 cosine theta has to equal 1, adding 1 to both sides of the equation. Dividing both sides of the equation by 2, we get cosine theta equals 1 half. And then now we just solve where is cosine of theta equal to 1 half. Well, cosine of theta is equal to 1 half at um, pi over 3. Now keep in mind there is a second location at 5 pi thirds, but that's not within the domain of our function. The only solution for cosine theta equals 1 half that's within our domain is pi thirds. Then from our other factor, our cosine theta plus 1, uh, that needs to equal 0. If we subtract 1 from both sides of the equation, we get cosine theta equals negative 1. And then where does cosine of theta equal negative 1? Well, that happens when theta is equal to pi. And as we have uh, noted that... <laughs> We won't have much of a rain gutter if theta is equal to pi. But regardless, uh, if we want to show that we do have a maximum uh, value, because this function is uh, defined on a closed interval, we can use our critical point at pi over 3 and uh, compare the area at that angle to the area at the endpoints. That is, we can consider what is the area when theta is 0, what is the area when theta is pi over 3, and what is the area when theta is pi. So if we do that, um, our area would be 100 sine of 0 plus 100 sine of 0 cosine of 0 which is 0 because sine of 0 is 0. Then we have um, area at pi over 3, so this would be 100 sine of pi over 3 plus 100 sine of pi over 3 cosine of pi over 3. which is equal to um, sine of pi over 3 is square root 3 over 2 plus 100 times sine of pi over 3 square root 3 over 2 and square root or cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. So we can simplify this up a little bit. The 2 and the 100 can um, simplify and what we end up with is 150 square roots of 3 over 2. Or more simply, 75 square root of 3. Lastly, we have area at pi. Well, that would be 100 times sine of pi plus 100 sine of pi cosine of pi, and much as was the case when theta was equal to 0, sine of pi is 0, so both of those terms are 0, and 0 plus 0 is 0. So we have three values here. We've got 0, we've got 75 square roots of 3, and we have 0. So we can see that we do have a maximum when theta is equal to pi over 3. So let's go ahead and state our conclusion. And so what we found is that the rain gutter will have maximum carrying capacity when the left and right thirds of the metal are bent through an angle of pi over 3 
or 60 degrees. I hope you find this helpful.